Yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dear guests, welcome to our CMA webinars organized by the Alexandria Thyroid Association, the Egyptian ATA. The Egyptian ATA is the first Egyptian society launched in October 2016 and has been created for public purposes and educational purposes. The educational purposes aims for raising the clinical practice for junior staff throughout repeated training program CME courses. The ATA is an affiliated society member of the European Society of Endocrinology since September 2017. The ATA organized two semi-annual thyroid-themed conference under the name of the CyroAlex. All the information about our Egyptian ATA is available on our Facebook page where you can find all updates about our organization. Finally, I want uh, 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 anyone who wants to register, the registration is now open for the new member. And finally, I wish you a fruitful scientific day, inshallah. Okay, um, um, my name is uh, Tamer Sherbini. I'm Vice President of Alexandria Thyroid Association. Um, I believe some of you have attended our first webinar. Um, the plan is to have uh, a monthly webinar uh, for one year uh, of CME that is concerned with, um, of course, thyroid topics. Uh, we started the first theme that is pregnancy and thyroid. The first webinar was hypothyroidism and thyroid. And uh, this one, the second webinar, is going to be hyperthyroidism and uh, pregnancy. And the first, uh, the first topic of today's uh, webinar uh, is going to be uh, a thyroid nodules. Okay, so we, we prefer to talk about thyroid nodules when we are talking about the excess uh, of uh, thyroid hormones. Um, I'm proud to present uh, Dr. Susan Mandel. Dr. Susan is a professor and chief of endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism uh, division in uh, University of Pennsylvania. She is also a member of the writing committee of the coming uh, uh, American Thyroid Association guidelines regarding the thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. And she's going to address the topic of uh, uh, management of thyroid nodules with a special reference to pregnancy. So uh, go ahead, Dr. Susan. Thank you very, very much. Um, I think you can all see my slides. So yeah, it's, yeah. An, it's an honor to be with you today and to join you and um, uh, to be able to talk about thyroid nodules. And um, the reference to pregnancy I'll put mostly at the end. Um, and um, as we go through the talk, I will insert special reference to pregnancy as well. But um, for those of you who also spend your time taking care of lots of non-pregnant um, patients of all genders, this certainly applies to anyone who has a thyroid nodule. Um, in the world of thyroid nodules, uh, we have many, many options that we can use for our diagnostic evaluation. Ultrasound is really the foundation. We talk about FNA cytology. Um, molecular testing is available in some of the countries of this international audience and not yet available in others. And we'll talk about options of observation versus surgery. And I think I may have left out my disclosure slide, but I have no financial, dis oh, here, I have no financial disclosures. But I do have another declaration, as Tamara just said to you, I actually have been a member of the writing group in 2015 for the ATA guidelines. And in 2021, and we hope these will be published in January of 2022, I'm actually co-chairing the American Thyroid Association guidelines for the evaluation of thyroid nodules. We have separated the guidelines for thyroid cancer that is being co-chaired by Matt Ringel and by Julianne Sosa. So, so the way I've organized the talk is first, we will briefly review the epidemiology of thyroid cancer. Then we'll talk about what are the thyroid sonographic classification systems. You may see them referred to as risk, risk sonographic risk stratification systems or RSSs, risk stratification systems. We'll then talk about FNA cytology using Bethesda, um, the Bethesda II classification, but how the cytology risk of malignancy is modified by the sonographic appearance of the nodules, and then a very brief review of molecular testing. 
So here I show you probably one of my favorite slides because it looks worldwide at the standardized rates of thyroid cancer. Now this is about five years old, but what it shows you is based upon the Human Development Index, which is developed by the World Bank as a composite index of a country's life expectancy and education. The HDI is scored between zero and one and very HDI countries are those that are over 0.8, HDI are between 0.7 and 0.8, medium HDI are 0.6 to 0.7, and low HDI are below that. Um, Egypt happens to be here in the high HDI countries, but what you can really see is that if you look at the incidence rates shown in green for females and males, that the incidence rates increase as the resources in a country increase. And there are a number of studies that have shown that access to medical care and access to imaging is highly correlated with the increased incidence in thyroid cancer diagnoses. Um, fortunately, mortality is significantly lower. And even in countries where incidence rates are increasing, the mortality, although increasing, is increasing at a much lower rate. And reflecting the fact that this really is about access to imaging and healthcare, the increase in thyroid cancer diagnoses is largely, almost 90%, attributable to small tumors less than two centimeters that we don't feel but are found incidentally on imaging studies. So this has led to the concept of overdiagnosis of cancer, meaning that you diagnose a cancer in your patient, but the patient goes on and lives a perfectly normal life and dies from something that is totally unrelated to that diagnosis of cancer. This, um, for example, has been used to describe prostate cancer, as we all know, and people are cutting back on PSA screening. But there are a couple of prerequisites for overdiagnosis. There has to be a disease reservoir, and certainly we do have this in thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer is present worldwide in about one in seven patients at autopsy. There have to be activities that lead us to detect this reservoir. And then this mismatch in the incidence rates that are really going up, especially in these higher HDI countries and mortality rates, which are pretty flat. But this is where we as endocrinologists come in because you really can't diagnose thyroid cancer um, unless you do an FNA. And it really provides the rationale for being as judicious as we can in selecting nodules for FNA. So whenever we talk about the workup of thyroid nodules, um, we talk about first doing a TSH test. Now, as you know, in pregnancy, TSH can go down in the first trimester. So if the nodule is found in the first trimester and the TSH is 0.3, you don't really know if it is the functioning thyroid nodule because the nodule is causing the TSH to be low or if it's just normal gestational pregnancy. And you can certainly recheck the TSH later in gestation when it goes up. And if it goes up, you would probably assume it's non-functioning nodule. But if the TSH remains low, this could be functioning nodules. You do not do scans in pregnancy. This is for postpartum. But just to remind you, these functioning nodules, we don't biopsy. If the TSH is normal or high, we don't necessarily do a scan to show they're non-functioning nodules, but 95% of nodules don't function. And these are the nodules that are potential candidates for FNA. And here is where we do the diagnostic thyroid ultrasound because it is for risk stratification based upon the sonographic appearance. And the most commonly used ultrasound classification systems worldwide are really the American College of Radiology and the American Thyroid Association. And they're a little bit different. The ATA is a pattern-based atlas and you do modify your decision-making about FNA based upon patient-specific factors. So if there's a family history of thyroid cancer in a couple of relatives, or for example, if your patient is an adult survivor of a malignancy where they received head and neck radiation, which increases the risk of malignancy. The American College of Radiology system called TIRADS is a system that's based upon points assigned to some individual features that we will review. And it was really geared for radiologists to help them make recommendations about FNA based upon the ultrasound appearance of a nodule. Um, the one thing I want you to notice is that TIRADS was just developed in 2017 the ATA in 2016. So these are relatively new risk stratification systems. ACR TIRADS is based upon five ultrasound features, 
Composition, is it solid or cystic? Echogenicity, how dark is the nodule compared to the background thyroid? Shape, is the nodule taller than wide on a transverse view? Margins, are they smooth and regular or are they clearly defined and irregular or infiltrative? And what kind of bright reflectors or echogenic foci are present in the nodule? There are points assigned for each of these features the sum determines the risk category, and that subsequently leads to recommendations either for biopsy, FNA, or surveillance if no biopsy. So this is what ACR TIRADS looks like. You can see on the top, you have composition, echogenicity, shape, margins, and echogenic foci. You can see the individual features within each of these classifications and how many points you get. The points determine the actual, excuse me, determine the actual category here that range from TR1 to TR5, benign to highly suspicious. But what I'm gonna show you in the next couple of slides is how similar ATA and ACR um, systems are and how we can use them. So here is something that the ATA would call benign, a pure cyst. The ACR system would call this TIRADS1. This, for those of you who don't look at normal thyroids, the gray here is the normal thyroid, the black is the cyst fluid, and these type of pure cysts do not get FNA in either system. Now, as we move up to a slightly higher risk pattern, but still very low risk, this is called a very low suspicion pattern by the ATA. This is called a TIRADS2 by the ACR, so very, very low risk. And this also includes partially cystic and solid nodules as well, where the solid part itself has that mixed cystic solid appearance. So for those of you who don't look at ultrasound, the black here is fluid, the gray is the solid part. And you can see here that these nodules, observation alone without FNA is very, very valid. Um, if you were to FNA, the ATA said these nodules should be quite large, over two centimeters for FNA. Most of us are observing these very low risk nodules, also termed spongiform. Now, as we move up in our risk, these are images from the ATA Atlas that correspond to TIRADS3. These are now considered a low suspicion pattern. So here is the background thyroid, and the nodule you can see is the same gray scale as the background thyroid. These are considered ISO, or perhaps if they're slightly brighter, hyperechoic nodules. You can see that they have smooth margins. You can take a pen and draw an oval around the nodule. The cancer risk is about 5 to 10 percent. So here, you can also include some mixed cystic solid nodules, but what I want you to look at is the solid part of the mixed cystic solid nodule is uniformly solid, looking just like a solid nodule that looks in the same category. Now the cutoffs here are a little bit different and that's where you're gonna see changes in the performance. But in general, what you're seeing is as the risk of cancer goes up, the size cutoff for FNA will decrease. As we come to the next pattern, with now a slightly higher risk of malignancy. The ATA would call this intermediate suspicion, ACR TIRADS, TIRADS4. These are hypoechoic solid nodules. You can see the nodule is darker than the surrounding thyroid, hypoechoic, regular margins. And you can see the cutoffs here are smaller. Again, a few differences between the two. ACR usually recommending a biopsy at a slightly higher size but similar classification. And then here is our highest risk category. And this includes a number of features, all of which are categorized in TIRADS-5, the highest risk or ATA high suspicion. You can have hypoechoic nodules with these bright spots called punctate echogenic foci, irregular margins where you can see that you can't draw a smooth line around them. You can see that they can have a taller than wide shape on a transverse view. This is the carotid artery for those of you who are not used to looking at ultrasounds. You can see that this nodule even invades into the surrounding perithyroidal tissue. This has a suspicious calcification. And lastly, we always look at lymph nodes. And this nodule, although very small in the thyroid, has an abnormal cervical lymph node. So both, both guidelines recommend biopsy at the smallest size, greater than or equal to one centimeter. 
and the ATA and ACR TIRADS instruct that all ultrasound exams of the thyroid should always evaluate the lymph nodes to find that suspicious lymph node because that would then recommend biopsy even if the nodule is very small. And the ATA will modify some of the cutoffs based upon patient-specific risk factors that we discussed. Now, for the endocrinologists and those who are more used to looking at ultrasounds, um, there are some nodules that are non-classifiable by the ATA. And here you can see a nodule that we would say has mixed echogenicity. There's a brighter area here and a darker area here, a mixed echogenicity nodule. TIRADS does have a way to classify it. It is solid and echogenicity cannot be determined. So TIRADS 3. And here is a nodule also that cannot be classified by ATA. It is mixed cystic solid, but predominantly solid, isoechoic over here with punctate echogenic foci. TIRADS would give it predominantly solid, isoechoic, punctate echogenic foci, TIRADS 4. What we've learned from several studies in the literature is that these nodules should be classified as an ATA intermediate risk suspicion nodule, and the recommendation would be for FNA at around one centimeter. So this has been validated in the literature, and you'll see this in the next iteration of the guidelines. On the other hand, it is very common to see macrocalcifications. So here is an isoechoic nodule. This is a macrocalcification here that has shadowing posterior to the nodule. And it turns out that although TIRADS would give it solid and isoechoic with one point for macrocalcification, increasing the risk to TR4, studies have shown that these nonspecific macrocalcifications do not alter the cancer risk associated with grayscale features. And this nodule can be treated as otherwise a TIRADS-3 or an ATA low suspicion nodule. And this reference here actually has to do with TIRADS stating that these macrocalcifications should not increase risk. So this was a little bit more for the specialists out there in the audience. There are other ultrasound classification systems. Um, there's one by ACE, by the European Thyroid Association and the Korean Thyroid Association. There's also an international work group that is working to harmonize these. But I think the most important thing is whether you look at ATA and TIRADS or ATA and ACE or ETA and ATA, they're all effective. And what they're effective at is that risk stratification and for ruling out FNA. So there are a large number of nodules that based upon this classification do not need FNA. And turning to a really great study from Italy where 500 nodules were all biopsied. If they then applied either the criteria of ACR TIRADS or the ATA, about 50% of those nodules would not require biopsy based upon their ultrasound appearance. So this is really good news. You can do an ultrasound and now identify many nodules that don't need a biopsy and reassure our patients. Well, as I said, ACR and ATA, although they categorize nodules similarly, because of their differences in size cutoffs where the ATA modifies and biopsies at a smaller size cutoff, it's more sensitive and less specific. But again, this is because of the lower FNA size cutoffs. So it's not about how nodules are categorized, but it's where the size cutoff is where the ATA has recommended a lower size cutoff. And if you just modify the ATA to change the size cutoffs to let's say biopsy that isoechoic low suspicion nodule at a slightly larger size of two centimeters and not even off offer the option of biopsy for the spongiform very low suspicion nodule, you can see that the ATA still has a very high sensitivity and a better specificity. So it's not about how nodules are categorized, it's about where you decide to do the biopsy. Now, once you make that decision to biopsy, we then have to deal with the cytology results. So we can get back Bethesda 2 benign or Bethesda 6 malignant. We can also get back non-diagnostic, but a number of our cytology results fall in an indeterminate or suspicious category, which in the Bethesda system have been broken down into Bethesda 3, 4, and 5 with these descriptors. 
So now let's go through these and figure out what we can do for our patient, because we're going to look at how ultrasound can help us to understand the cancer risk associated with the cytology diagnosis. So here are the reported cancer risks associated with Bethesda 1 to Bethesda 6. You can see how the cancer risk goes up the more you go down the chart. But let's start here. We're going to put the indeterminate categories, Bethesda 3 and 4, a little bit later. I've broken out Bethesda 5 and from the indeterminates because the cancer risk is high enough that most patients go to surgery. But let's start now by looking at each of these categories and what we can tell our patients. So if the diagnostic result from cytology does not yield enough cells, this is considered non-diagnostic. There's nothing for our pathologist to do. And the recommendation is to repeat the FNA with ultrasound. But what I wanna show you here is if your nodule yielded a non-diagnostic cytology, if you look at the ultrasound appearance of the nodule, based upon the presence of the five foundational ultrasound features we talked about, solid composition, hypoechogenicity, irregular margins, punctate echogenic foci and shape. You can see that as the nodule looks more suspicious, the likelihood of cancer increases. But if the nodule doesn't look very suspicious, you might draw a line here and not even recommend a repeat FNA. So how do these nodules look? And here they are. So our nodules that are ATA very low or low are TIRADS 2 and 3. If they yield a non-diagnostic cytology, the likelihood of malignancy is so low, you probably do not have to repeat the biopsy. But as the nodule has more suspicious ultrasound features, TIRADS 4 and 5, ATA intermediate and high, these are the nodules for which you would recommend a biopsy and if it's still non-diagnostic surgery. Now let's turn to benign. So a very common diagnostic category where the recommendation has been for observation. And traditionally, the recommendation has been observation, follow up ultrasound and repeat the biopsy if it grows. But how long do you do ultrasounds? And how many biopsies do you have to do? And so I'd like to direct you to a wonderful systematic review published in 2016 that really looked at all of the studies that assessed whether growth of a cytologically benign nodule was the best way to identify the missed malignancy? And the answer is no. Growth will not identify the missed malignancy with very high confidence. In fact, it has very low confidence. And our practice of following benign nodules with multiple ultrasounds to look for growth should be questioned. So what is the best way to identify a benign cytology nodule that may be the missed cancer? And let's go back to looking at the ultrasound appearance of the nodule that yielded the benign biopsy. So here I'm gonna put up, as the nodule acquires more suspicious ultrasound features, the likelihood that you've missed a cancer is higher and perhaps the cutoff should be around here. And let's look at how these nodules look. So here, ACR, TIRADS 2, 3, and 4 are sort of lower. TIRADS 5 nodules that yield a benign biopsy are the ones that we really should question. And for those nodules with a high suspicion TIRADS 5 pattern, we should repeat the ultrasound in 12 months. For the spongiform TIRADS 2, isoechoic solid TIRADS 3 nodules, those probably are benign. And I am gonna put a question mark here because I'm going to share my own practice for TIRADS4 or intermediate risk hypoechoic solid nodules with smooth margins. So for nodules with benign cytology, we know that the likelihood of a false negative result is very low at high volume centers. Use the ultrasound to assess the baseline risk of malignancy after the biopsy and determine follow-up. And remember, look at your patient comorbidities. If this is an older patient who um, do really need to follow that nodule if it has a benign cytology versus in a younger patient. So in my practice, 
I'm still a little not certain about those TIRADS4 ATA intermediate suspicion hypochoic nodules. And I continue to follow those. And if they do grow at three to four years, I might consider a repeat biopsy or if their ultrasound pattern changes to a more suspicious nodule. For my nodules that are benign that have a low or very low TIRADS2 or TIRADS3 pattern, I don't follow them for repeat biopsy, but for growth and development of compressive symptoms. And so they get a clinical follow-up. And this approach has actually been validated recently by a group in Italy. This is the approach of the American Thyroid Association. Now for our two nodule categories, cytology categories, where there's a high risk of cancer, they go to surgery and we always look, use an ultrasound to look at the lateral cervical lymph nodes to make sure that that doesn't change our surgery. But I'd like to now focus for the rest of the talk for the next five minutes on Bethesda three and four, the two categories with risks of cancer between let's say 10 and 35% and talking about repeat FNA, surgery and molecular testing if available. So first of all, the question is how common is it to get an indeterminate cytology? And back in 2006, when we were biopsying pretty much all nodules, it was less common than in the 2015 guidelines where we have removed the low risk ultrasound feature nodules from biopsy. So you can see in 2006, the likelihood of an indeterminate cytology was only 8%, but now about a third of our nodules will have that indeterminate cytology because we are biopsying higher risk nodules. So if we look at whether ultrasound can modify the cancer risk of these indeterminate cytology Bethesda three and four nodules, this is gonna look a little different than the other two slides, but similar. Overall, the cancer risk for Bethesda three and four in these three studies, including our own, is about 26%. If the nodule looks spongiform, none of these nodules were malignant. If it were either iso or hypoechoic TR3 or TR4, the risk of cancer really didn't change. It was still around 15 to 35%. But if it were a sonographically suspicious TR5 nodule, the risk of cancer was much higher. So if your nodule Bethesda 3 or 4 is spongiform, you might not even repeat the biopsy and it's very high risk appearance, you might go straight to surgery. But it turns out, most nodules with Bethesda 3 or 4 cytology fall into the TR3, TR4, isoechoic, hypoechoic area where ultrasound really doesn't change risk. So this becomes then important because how can we help our patients? So first I want to remind you for Bethesda 3, there is a very important role for repeat FNA. And what's shown here are data from the United States shown in the darker green or the darker yellow, and data from Brazil, and I hear there are some Brazilians on the call, that have shown that if you repeat the FNA for Bethesda three nodules, that up to, in Brazil, 70%, but over about 50% of Bethesda three nodules on repeat FNA will have a benign cytology, and then you're done. Now, if you repeat it and it's still Bethesda 3, which will happen in about a quarter of nodules, that's enough to send them to surgery because two Bethesda 3 cytologies is about a 50% chance of cancer. So even in the absence of molecular testing for Bethesda 3, not Bethesda 4, repeat cytology is a very, very good option. But this then brings in the use of molecular tests where available because the idea is that we apply it to our Bethesda 3, 4 nodules with a baseline cancer risk of 25 to 35%, which then we get the molecular test. And if the molecular test is negative, that decreases the cancer risk so our patient doesn't have surgery. And if the molecular test is then positive, the cancer risk increases from that 25 to 35% to something above 50% and the patient needs surgery. So the basis for molecular testing is now from a paper that's about six years old, which is the Cancer Genome Atlas. And for papillary cancers, what was noted was that papillary cancers fall into two groups, 
the BRAF-like groups and the RAS-like groups. And these are very separate groups. The RAS-like groups tend to be more differentiated, the PTC follicular variants, the BRAF-like groups are the tall cell and the classic papillary cancers. And you can see that there are somatic mutations and fusions and they are split into either the RAS or the BRAF-like groups. So there are a number of these like Tata fusions, PAX, PPA, P PAX A, PPR, gamma fusions that are RAS-like. There are a number of these like the ALK and the NTRAC fusions that are BRAF-like. We can also look at microRNA clusters, which are small non-coding mRNAs that regulate genes and look at numbers of those as well. And with all of those there, these are all the new molecular tests that have come on the market in the United States since 2011. And these are the three that are currently on the market. So it is a very complex landscape for many of us who practice where we have multiple options available. And the challenge is that molecular testing is not regulated to the same degree as drug testing is when you get a drug on the market so that there is a spectrum of validation studies. You would want a validation study to be prospective, blinded, meaning the pathologist does not know the, re the result of the molecular test when he or she reads the final pathology, and multi-institutional, so you don't have an institutional bias. So a prospective, blinded, um, multi-institutional study, but some of the tests on the market have had retrospective studies that do not blind the pathologist or single institutions. And then once the test has gotten on the market, especially with some of the older tests, the pragmatic real world performance was very different than the published study. Fortunately, with the two new studies on the market now, the real world studies are much more robust. So when we're talking about a molecular test, there's a couple of things in our vocabulary we need to know. A positive predictive value is that if the molecular test is positive, it indicates that that patient then has a, that percentage, a 60% chance of having cancer or what we now call is a NIFT-P, the precancerous lesion. If the test is negative, that tells us even with the benign cytology having, with, excuse me, the indeterminate cytology having a negative result, that means the patient doesn't have cancer. The result is usually less than 3%. And we talk about something called a benign call rate. So given that our patient has an indeterminate cytology, what percentage of patients will have a benign result? So if the negative predictive value is high, which it is in these tests, even if you have an indeterminate cytology, based upon the benign call rate, that is the proportion of patients who will not need to have surgery, even if they have a Bethesda 3 or 4 cytology. So the two main tests on the market in the United States are the Affirma GSC, which is actually based upon mRNA and looks at fusions, looks at genes, and looks at a loss of heterozygosity for Herthel cell uh, nodules, which has certainly improved specificity, and something called Thyroseq version 3, which is based upon mostly DNA, and next-gen sequencing, but obviously some mRNA for fusions. And these are both very, very good tests. And if we look at the benign call rate, meaning your patient has Bethesda three or four cytology, 55 to 60% of patients will get a negative result and will not need to have surgery. And because the negative predictive value is so high, over 95%, with a negative result, even with Bethesda three or four cytology, these patients can be observed with a less than 5% chance of cancer. Now, if the result is positive, a little bit different for the Affirma GSC, the risk of cancer is 50% for Thyroseq a little bit higher, but these patients need to have surgery. So it is overwhelming when we talk to our patients and they ask us what is the best test. So to summarize then, for a nodule with Bethesda three or four cytology, I look at the ultrasound. And if it's truly a spongiform or TR1-2 nodule, I don't do anything else. Because remember, the likelihood of cancer is very low. If it is isoechoic or hypoechoic and solid with smooth margins, the cancer risk remains at 20 to 35%. And then I'm thinking, can I avoid surgery? This is where I repeat the FNA for the Bethesda three nodules. But if there is molecular testing available, I'll consider that. 
But if not, then these are the patients where you would think about lobectomy. On the other hand, if the nodule that yielded the Bethesda 3 or 4 cytology has a high suspicion or TR5 nodule without any abnormal lymph nodes, because that makes your diagnosis if the lymph nodes are abnormal, I know that the likelihood of cancer here, as I showed you, is probably about 65%, and I cannot use a molecular test. So for these patients, I recommend surgery. And in the future, I think molecular testing might be used here for prognostic values for type of cancer and extent of surgery. So in pregnancy, does every nodule require an FNA? No, the cystic cancer is slow growing. So you do not necessarily need to do an FNA unless there's ultrasound evidence of an aggressive cancer. I think this is an opportunity for shared decision-making with the patient. The FNA can be done during pregnancy, or in the absence of aggressive sonographic features, you can delay it until postpartum. If molecular testing is available, is it altered in pregnancy? It is not. You could do molecular testing in pregnancy if the FNA is done. Should surgery be done in pregnancy? It doesn't need to be done unless it's an aggressive cancer, but if done, the ideal time is at the end of the second trimester. And if cancer is diagnosed in pregnancy, what do you do? Well, certainly if it's the second half of gestation, you can wait till postpartum. If for some reason cancer is diagnosed early in pregnancy, the recommendations are to repeat the ultrasound at mid gestation. And then provided it's relatively stable and has not acquired aggressive features like extrathyroidal extension or metastatic lymph nodes, you can do surgery after delivery. If it looks aggressive, that is the time to consider surgery during pregnancy. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much. And this is just a picture of our boathouse row in Philadelphia. Okay. Uh, Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Professor Susan. Uh, the presentation was fantastic, as called by our uh, colleague, Dr. Khalid Youssef. <laughs> and um, um, we had a glimpse of what's coming in the, in the new guidelines. Um, there are more details to, to look for uh, later. I think the stratification according to uh, the patient characteristics, this should be waived until we have the final release of the guidelines. Um, you have talked about combining ultrasound with uh, fine needle aspiration cytology. After having the result of fine needle aspiration cytology, this is new to the guidelines. And I think this would be uh, very informative. Um, for the questions, uh, currently I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question is, if, uh, if TSH is low with a nodule size of one to two centimeters, so what is the next uh, for thyroid nodules? Should we do thyroid scan or should we go for fine needle aspiration biopsy according to ultrasound risk stratification? I'm sorry, what was the size of the nodule? One to two centimeters. Yeah, so it's a really good question and it depends on how low the TSH is. Um, so uh, most nodules do not um, cause thyrotoxicosis until they're over three centimeters. So it would be pretty unlikely for a nodule that's less than two centimeters alone not in the mm -hmm. setting of multiple nodules where you can have several functioning nodules that are less than two centimeters causing a low TSH. So the likelihood that that nodule is functioning is low with if it's only one to two centimeters. So what I would usually say there is we usually have to treat the thyrotoxicosis depending on how low the TSH is, and then we can take care of the nodule. And sometimes um, for example, if someone has Graves' disease, but the nodule is sonographically suspicious, although you might otherwise treat the Graves' disease with carbimazole, methimazole, if the nodule then looks you know, suspicious and you biopsy it, not that you would recommend thyroidectomy or subtotal thyroidectomy for the treatment of Graves, but if the nodule itself yields a Bethesda 5 or Bethesda 6 cytology, you might then opt for surgery that would take care of both the thyrotoxicosis and the nodule. So I think there, um, TSH low with a small nodule, unlikely to be the nodule, but we don't just treat nodules. In that case, when you're planning your treatment plan and diagnostic evaluation, you have to consider the degree of thyrotoxicosis, the etiology, how you're gonna treat it and factor in the sonographic appearance of the nodule and how that might alter your treatment plan for thyrotoxicosis. 
So if, if the cytotoxicosis is severe, would you recommend delaying this after control the metabolic state? I think and if, if it has very or many suspicious features, would you do the same, wait for the metabolic control? No, so I think you can do an ultrasound immediately. You know, you can certainly see in someone, let's say they have Graves' disease. We're assuming Graves' disease because I was only told there was one nodule and not a toxic multi-nodule goiter. You can certainly evaluate the sonographic features of the nodule, and you can perform an FNA when someone is thyrotoxic. You do not precipitate thyrotoxic storm. Um, so obviously the most important thing for all of our patients is controlling their thyrotoxicosis, especially as they get older. So that should be your number one priority, but you do not have to wait for someone to be youth thyroid to perform the FNA. Um, if you do do the FNA and somebody is already on carbimazole or methimazole, it's very important to tell your cytologist that, as well as to let them know that that patient is thyrotoxic, because there is a literature that the antithyroid drug may alter the cytology. So the pathologist needs to know that so that they don't overinterpret a cytology as atypical because somebody is thyrotoxic or on methimazole. So if you do do the FNA in someone who's thyrotoxic and on treatment, give that information to the cytologist. Okay. The second uh, question, so there's two parts. First, it is um, a personal opinion, and then it is a question. The personal opinion is um, they see that uh, tyrads is sometimes subjective, but the question is, uh, what about multinodular goiter with tyrad 3? Should multiple FNA taken uh, or the largest only? You know, what a great question. Um, and I would love to know where this person is from. I don't know if that geography um, is there. Uh, okay, so um, what this person is asking is a very good question. What I, you know, I think that if you were to talk about what is the true appearance of a multinodular, a benign multinodular goiter, especially in an area of potential borderline iodine sufficiency, it generally tends to be multiple coalescent TR3 nodules or TR2 mixistic solid and TR3 nodules. And so it is not uncommon to see that. In fact, in the ATA guidelines, one of the things we say, if there are multiple coalescent low suspicion nodules, which corresponds to TR3, then just biopsy the largest one and assume that the cytology then reflects that. Um, I would say that you know, what ty the way TIRADS addresses it is they give you a cutoff of two and a half for TR3, um, but they say, I think the most that you should biopsy, I think there is a disclaimer somewhere about not biopsying more than two nodules in a patient at a time. I can't quite recall that, but that to me would be, remember where TIRADS um, doesn't necessarily address all the patient-specific features. So I would say if there are multiple TR3 or ATA isoechoic nodules, first you want to make sure you're not missing that occasional TR4, TR5 nodule that's hiding in there because that's the one you'd biopsy. But um, if they're not, um, you could consider doing a one-time FNA of the TR3 nodule. Um, or again, if they're multiple coalescent TR3 nodules, I think you may see in the new guidelines that that might be something that you could observe, but we haven't quite gotten there yet, but that may be something in the new guidelines. Of course, unless someone has symptoms, in which case you would think about symptomatic treatment because of very large goiter. Okay, so uh, the um, uh, it was uh, Dr. Maram Meher from uh, Ain Shams University. She was the one who asked the question. <laughs> so she's from Egypt. Um, uh, a third question there, uh, what is the TSH target in a patient known to have biliary thyroid cancer treated by thyroidectomy, uh, knowing that she is uh, pregnant in the first trimester? Yeah, really good question. So I think um, it depends upon the risk. And so uh, this has been dealt with. So you know what we do is after someone has an initial diagnosis of thyroid cancer based upon the ultrasound and the thyroid globulin at um, six to 12 months, we restratify patients into excellent response to therapy, biochemical incomplete, structural incomplete, and, and um, indeterminate. And so it all basically has to do with what we think the subsequent risk of recurrence is. So someone who is in an excellent or an indeterminate response to therapy, which are both considered very good, the TSH target can be what it would be for any pregnant woman. 
Um, whereas in someone, and I have patients who have metastatic lung disease, but it's been very stable, they get pregnant. You have patients, so that would be a structurally incomplete uh, response. Or someone who has a thyroglobulin of five, and they just, you know, they get pregnant, maybe you can't find anything on ultrasound or on CAT scan, but the thyroglobulin has been stable. That's a biochemical incomplete response. You probably want to keep their TSH between 0.1 and 0.3. I don't think you have to be less than 0.1, but keep it, you know, just below the normal range during pregnancy. I think as long as free T4 is not uh, higher than normal, this can be sustained even if we have uh, totally suppressed TSH. As uh, according to the to the risk of recurrence, of course. Yeah. Um, um, actually, we have this comment uh, is just mentioning that molecular testing is is not available in our country. Yeah. Um, and again, one of the problems that we commonly encounter is the difference with the surgeon. So we have this comment uh, that uh, uh, surgeons here in, in our country say that as long as uh, the ultrasound is highly suspicious fine needle aspiration cytology is not indicated and they just go to surgery. So we have a lot of these um, opinions in our practice. Yeah, so, so, I, re yeah, so I, say, I realize that molecular testing isn't available, which is why I wanted to talk about repeat FNA for Bethesda 3 and also for Bethesda 3 and 4. If your nodule is isoechoic or mixistic solid, so TR3 or TR2, um, you know, you might consider the risk is maybe a little bit lower following that patient if they're not a good surgical candidate. Certainly if it's spongiform or TR2 or TR1, you don't have to do anything. Um, I certainly think if it's TR5, they should go to surgery. Um, the challenge is the TR3, TR4s, especially if they're not older, you probably, you know, think about surgery. The question about whether suspicious nodules should go directly to surgery, and I get this a lot, is that somebody's already brought up or um, people always bring up the variability interpretation of ultrasound. So um, what is, even though the um, we've tried to standardize by a sonographic atlas and Tyrads has tried to standardize what a Tyrads 5 nodule is, all of us who do ultrasound know there's a lot of overcall of suspicious nodules. So that is the last thing you would want is a patient with a quote, suspicious nodule on ultrasound where it might be an overcall of an ultrasound to go to surgery without an FNA. And I don't know what happens in Egypt and some of the countries that you are all from, um, whether surgeons will only do lobectomies or bilateral surgery. There are certain countries where surgeons say nodules are so common, if someone is going to surgery, we're doing the whole thyroid. Many countries, surgeons will do a lobectomy. So certainly you would not wanna subject someone to a thyroidectomy without a biopsy. But at the same time, you wouldn't want to do a lobectomy alone if the biopsy is going to show something that might lead to bilateral surgery. So that you really would want the biopsy to best define the extent of surgery. Thank you very much, Dr. Susan. Um, we are just about time for uh, the next uh, presentation. Uh, we thank you very much for being with us today for an excellent presentation. Um, we know that we have, uh, you have a very special occasion uh, today, and so uh, uh, we hope to see you uh, in the coming webinars. Um, uh, we well, Inshallah, meaning yeah. uh, God willing or God may, uh, may, uh, may allow this. Uh, see you soon, see you soon. You. Uh, very good health. Thank you so thank much you. for everything. Enjoy thank your you. afternoon. Thank bye bye. You. Bye bye. 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 <clears throat> yeah.